and she's going to be talking about food and faith. Thanks, Emma. Um, okay, so just before the coffee break and when everybody wants to go and have a snack, I'm going to talk about food. Um, so I am in the second year of my PhD, just about to start my third, so I'm in the middle of all of my lab work, so some of this is highly speculative, so bear with me. Okay, so basically I'm going to take you through my project rationale, talk about basically what this session is about, multidisciplinary, multi-proxy approaches. Give a whiz bang to us through paleo diet and stable isotope analysis. Apologies, I know some of you are well versed in this, but just for anybody who needs to kind of know what on earth I'm on about. Talk about identity reconstruction and life history and how isotopes can tie into this. A little bit about the fish event horizon and then basically my PhD data. So why am I looking at this? Why are we mostly sort of all gathered in this room and interested in this? The seventh century, as we've all sort of been talking about, and in fact, you know, sort of really the fifth through to the eighth and ninth, is a big period of transition across Europe, particularly in Anglo-Saxon England. When I started my PhD, I was initially interested in Christianization and whether or not we could maybe trace this not through just burials, but also the stable isotopes. Looking at diet, mobility, does this match up? Spoiler alert, not necessarily. So, I have a bit of a bizarre background <laughs> um, in terms of how I'm coming at this. Um, I've got both a medieval archaeology background as well as biochemistry background, so I decided to use a multi-proxy um, and interdisciplinary approach. And this is some definite pros and cons and some huge challenges that I'm trying to work through my PhD. So I'm trying to bring together the historical elements um, that we heard a bit about from um, Katie earlier, material culture, bring in the osteology and the biochemistry, as well as funerary archaeology, the burials, the grave goods, cemetery layout, and then tie in things like theology and anthropology of religion to really look at how and why these things are occurring and what impact that might have on everyday life. This is multi-scalar. I'm doing everything from individual approach up to um, a whole sort of Anglo-Saxon um, framework. It's quite multivariate, and this has some pros in terms of overlapping and complementary evidence, but it's also causing me a bit of a nightmare in terms of my stats and how to kind of bring this all together. So any suggestions would be great. So what am I doing? Paleo diet and stable isotope analysis. Uh, there's lots of different parts of the skeleton you can sample, and each of these different tissues will give you different signatures, and you're able to do different um, analyses on each of these. So what I'm specifically looking at is I'm trying to take one rib and one tooth per individual. Sometimes this is um, fine. Sometimes the preservation on the site doesn't allow for this. And essentially, the reason why I'm doing this is because the ribs, we think, um, from Tamsin O'Connell's work, gives you roughly about the last 10 years of life. And this is because your ribs, you're breathing all the time, so it's probably got the highest turnover rate of bone. So you're getting the freshest, most newest bone, I guess, um, in terms of diet remodeling. So get carbon and nitrogen for diet. And I'm getting teeth because I can use both the tooth root, the dentine, to also look at diet, carbon and nitrogen, and using mostly premolars, second premolars and second molars, because they're formed roughly at about the same time, to look at post-weaning childhood signatures. So I want to look at individuals at the beginning of life as well as close to their end of life. So I'm mostly looking at adults as well. But also I can have the tooth enamel, which allows me to do carbonate analysis on that enamel, which gives me another carbon proxy, which I'm hoping will help me sort out freshwater fish. And anybody who does stabilized tips will know that is a bit of a nightmare, but that is my aim. Um, as well as oxygen to look at mobility. And if anybody would like to give me extra money to do strontium, please feel free to chuck me a grant. Mm -hmm. I have approximately 1,200 individuals already from pre-published data that are in my data set and I'm incorporating into a meta-analysis. And personally, I'm doing about 350 individuals across 14 sites. So that's roughly about 700 samples in terms of CNN and about 300 for um, carbonate. And in terms of the faunal baselines, I've only got fauna that is well contextualized um, and not just from grave fill from two out of my 14 sites. So this isn't great, but this is where I'm going back to the pre-published data to try to use those faunal baselines to give us a background. Apologies after Emma's beautiful GIS for my really hastily throwing together um, Google map, but this is to roughly show you the spread of my sites across um, Britain. So this is where I'm going to be looking at 
the individuals across their life course, looking at the sites, <laughs> looking at that population, bringing up to regional analyses, uh, because environment plays a big role in what you're going to eat, as well as doing a big comparison with all of those other sites in my meta-analysis. So, this is my meta-analysis to date. Um, it is messy, it isn't the best graph ever, but this is just for anybody who's unfamiliar with where certain animal, animals and certain types of food might map. Um, and I don't think James Barrett is in here because he gave me hell for putting orcas up there because yes, no Anglo-Saxons don't eat orcas. But to give you an idea, this is where a carnivorous marine mammal would map, actually much further off the Richter scale there. If you've got your carbon along baseline here and nitrogen on your vertical axis. Carbon roughly relates to the types of plants that you're eating the type of environment. In Anglo-Saxon England, I do not expect and I have not found any C4 plants. So this is really kind of eh for us. Everyone's eating the same sorts of plants. Nitrogen is to do with your length of your food chains and the type of protein and how much protein you're eating. So freshwater fish are a bit annoying because yes, they map here, but also they map all the way across here as well. This is why freshwater fish in your diet and trying to work out if eating them in Christianization can become quite difficult. You've got your salmonids over here and your marine fish. Some other cod and marine fish also go off my scale here. We've got birds and dogs, pigs and humans here, so your omnivores, and your lovely little cute sheep and cows, so your herbivores here. And if humans, it, just for anybody to have the reference, if you are a vegan, you will match somewhere around here. So basically no animal protein input, but if you're a vegetarian, guess what? If you're eating any cheese or any eggs, you map with everybody else who's eating meat. But to give you a bit of a context there as well. So what questions can we actually ask and possibly answer with this approach and how will this relate into emerging <coughs> transitions? So as archeologists, we get people like this with their grave goods. We've got the skeleton and we can ask biological questions about their biological identity and their life history. So the isotopes talk about diet and mobility, the osteology to answer questions about age, sex, pathology, DNA to talk about relatedness, but also if you're looking at pathogen DNA to look at health and diet as well, and possibly mobility. And then eventually, and apologies, yes, I do know that this is a Viking reconstructed grave, but it was just so nice I had to put it up. Um, we want to then get to how this individual went into the ground and the things that we've possibly lost talk about the funerary sphere and the things that make up that burial. And we can then talk about social identity. So the grave goods, this is where that will play into the next level of my analysis, the funerary archeology span and the depositional process, but then gender versus the osteological sex, age and what that might mean socially. Who were these people? And eventually I want to get from that to what they were eating and drinking during their life course, what that might've been for practice, ritual, economy. And anybody who works in this time period, we know that things like the Bay of Tapestry are pretty much as good as it's going to get in terms of trying to get to what people are actually eating. And most of the Anglo-Saxon records about food are either very, very vague or they're medicinal in purpose. So we can't necessarily take what they're using medicinally for what they're eating day to day. But Debbie Benham's work does give us quite a lot about what they might have been growing and had access to. So this fish event horizon, which also impacts on the radiocarbon dates that he was talking about, what we're finding from new uh, zooarchaeological work, which I'm hoping to integrate, is the fact that we've actually got sort of two fish event horizons. So what the green is showing here is actually freshwater fish remains in London, and then we've got blue, which is marine fish remains. So these are skeletal elements that we're able to find in excavations. This first line here is 600, and you see this huge spike, okay, in green there, with, compared to basically nothing in the Roman period. This isn't to say that Romans weren't eating fish, we know they were, but we're seeing this huge spike, okay, which then carries on and we get this even bigger one, which is the expected one that James Barrett and David Orning have talked about, and this is isotopically what we see, the marine fresh versus freshwater fish big jump here. So what I'm interested in is we know about this, this is quite well characterized isotopically. This is harder to characterize isotopically, and as most of you all know, trying to get evidence for freshwater or fish remains on most Anglo-Saxon settlement sites has been quite difficult. Sieving wasn't always done on some of these very well-known earlier excavated sites. Um, so this is something that will hopefully I might be able to untease with the tooth enamel to maybe match up with some of this nice new data that's coming out of the zoo archaeology. So what am I getting? 
So there's some really nice regional patterns that are coming out, and I think regionality has a lot to do with what we're seeing during the early medieval transition. So Wessex is generally pretty low. This is also backed up with the same um, patterns in the uh, animal isotopes, the faunal baselines, and the regional differences. So generally, the people who are eating fish are mostly coastal, unsurprisingly, and that's also mostly got to do with um, the time period as well, which we can see here. So you see general shift through time, but this is also very <coughs> much tied to the regionality. So a lot of the individuals who are here are the Wessex individuals who don't have access to the coast, so this is unsurprising. So one of my two um, case studies for you here is King's Garden Hostel. So I got this data about a month ago. Um, 12 individuals, 7th century, and I picked these two women from these two different sites because they're roughly the same age, they're contemporaneous, to just show you basically what two women in two different parts of England are eating. Got some reused um, grave goods as well, so a reused coin from the 4th century, female, 45 years old, general skeletal degradation, and has a isotope signature that basically tells me not eating much or any fish at all, very terrestrial diet, lovely, beautiful, what I would expect for Cambridgeshire. We then go to Fingalsham in Kent, and some of you might have noticed, so I've tried to keep the apses the same here. There is generally a much lower shift in the nitrogen here. Okay, we've got some outliers, and I'm working on trying to work out what exactly is going on there, so please don't ask me. Um, I got this mass spec data last week, so I haven't had a chance to untangle it. 40 individuals. We're going to look at this woman here, grave 180. She's got some very nice grave goods. Um, relatively well furnished, although not as high status as some other graves as we've seen today. Roughly about 30 years old, possibly older. Some dental pathologies, but generally she's in pretty good skeletal health. Carbon within 1% per mil of the other individual, which indicates about the same type of um, plant resources that she's eating, but about 2% per mil, which generally in isotope terms means you're eating a different type of protein resource, in this case, a lot lower. Okay, so in Kent, and this is generally what I'm finding across the whole of Kent, they're eating a lot less protein. Why? I'm not sure. Most of my sites are relatively coastal. They're quite close to very good harbours. What's going on here? Kent is weird, isotopically. So will this approach work to try to untease some of these transitions from the early to the later medieval period? I am now pushing the boundaries of when some of my um, sites are going up to. I've got one cemetery that goes from the 7th through to the 11th century. So I'm hoping once I get that data back that will really help us tease across in one population what's going on. So hopefully this multi-proxy approach will give us some indications of what people are eating, what that means economically and how that might also reflect these changes that Emma and um, other speakers have been talking about in the burials through time. So we do see some change through time, but ge geographical differences are really at the core here, I think. There's definitely regional differences, and that's got to be, I think, to do with your economic basis and what you've actually got available. But with things like Kent, why aren't they fishing? Um, there is a lot of diversity, both individually, but also regionally, in terms of both grave goods and sometimes to do with diet. But this can lead us to hopefully reconstructing some identities and I think there's major potential for these techniques going forward and hopefully when I get the carbonate results back in the dentine to look at earlier life, this might tell me if things um, are actually changing on a individual's lifetime basis or if it's a much longer durée in terms of these processes. So thank you.